Good morning. This is Palm Sunday, the 5th of April 2020. It's the beginning, the first Sunday or first day of the great week of Lent, the week that we have Good Friday and uh, eventually on Sunday morning the wonderful celebration of Easter. Um, and this is the opportunity that the church look forward and love celebrating because it is so important. It's the crucial point of our faith and our belief because it's a combination point of everything that um, comes together and that opens up the vision of God's kingdom and God's love for all of us. Um, therefore, I want to pray that this week will be a wonderful experience to all of you and that you will be taken in your spirit and in your mind um, to focus on the meaning of these three days and what was what has happened there and what it means in your and in the life of the church and the life of the world and the message that we can send out and that we can bless the world with with the hope and of the gospel of jesus christ let's pray together thank you lord that we can be together in this way that we can have communion with each other but also with you for you are always with us thank you for your love and your care and your peace even amidst situations that are out of our control and that has got a lot of challenges to many people i pray that you will guide us and lead us through your word and through your spirit to uplift us and to help each other, to carry each other's crosses and burdens. And I pray, Lord, that we will enjoy the love and the peace of Jesus Christ. And we think of Psalm 23, the very uh, beloved Psalm, uh, that you guide us and you know that where you are leading us and you bring us to the waters of peace. And even if you go through tribulation, Lord, that you will be with us. And we don't need to be afraid or scared of anything. Thank you, Lord, that we can um, enjoy your presence and your guidance in this time. Amen. We are also almost in the middle of the shutdown of the COVID-19 in South Africa and in most countries in the world. We experience the same um, challenges surrounding the uh, shutdown and the challenges of COVID. And it's the first time in my life that I experience something like this or anything like it. And one can't help to think about this, about this and what the meaning of it is. And uh, it makes us want to ask questions that I think we may have uh, didn't ask before or in the same manner with, with, the, with the same intensity. intensity. Um, we are in trouble by some of the things. But the wonderful thing about asking questions is that it leads us to answers um, or renewed insight in truths and it's with that glasses that we go to the Word and seek for God's guidance. And I believe that there's some things that we know about, but it's almost as if it um, has new meaning because we ask it in a different manner. We ask the same question or different questions, and it's got a new meaning and implication in our lives. I also would like to link what the Minister of Health said two days ago about entering the second week of COVID and the shutdown that he wants to encourage the nation to, to stand firm, to keep on doing what the, minister, the President asked us to do or ordered us to do, um, to stay at home. Because the natural thing of people is to relax after a while. So yeah, it's not spreading and we all say it and it's all fine and, and we're almost um, releasing um, ourselves of the burden of staying at home. 
to stay firm. And I'd like to connect that thing about, um, about the humanity and who we are and how we are also regarding the gospel. Because um, it's 2,000 years later, after the events of Easter, of the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And after 2,000 years, the same tendency may be true of, of faith in Jesus Christ. That people are not that um, committed to the truth and to what God, Jesus told us and teached us to do. If you think about the happening on those three days, it was for the disciples, for those who were there, an impactful, um, dramatic, a, a bad experience. An experience that made them switch totally about how they saw everything, how they saw life, how they saw uh, the, the meaning of life in itself. It is almost as if in the history of mankind, of, of everything, it is like an hourglass that comes together and has a narrow part and then it opens up again. It's almost as if it's this narrow part that the whole of history is sucked into to pour out into a new meaning and a new beginning. Now Jesus, uh, the Bible also describes it as um, the Gospel of John, that Jesus coming to the world is almost like a light shining in the world. It, before it was darkness, it was a dark chamber. But in the new chamber, there's light and there's hope and there's meaning. And this light that shines, um, shines then especially on these three days. It's the culmination point. And it's almost, and I'd like to use a, a metaphor of a prism. Now we all know what happens when light or light beam shines on a prism. It's on the other side, it's got a spectrum of colors and light of the rainbow from red, orange, um, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And almost as it's as if the same thing happens when the light of the gospel shines in our lives. It's got a different spectrum of meanings and implications in our lives. One is a personal meaning. Um, you once was lost and now you found um, it's the old human being, the old man versus the new man. It's a totally new way of living and no new being. There's also another dimension to it uh, regarding being saved. Now, being saved is all about the relationship with God and the reconciliation with God. So it's a uh, relational meaning. Another meaning of the colors of the spectrum of what happened in these three days is a cosmic meaning. For God so loved the world. It's not only the human being or the individual or even humankind. It is about everything. It's about the cosmos that God includes and renew. It looks, I make, I make everything new. Then there's also a dimension about uh, supernatural things that we don't see and that we don't um, can't explain. Um, we've Jesus, through his crucifixion, has dealt with evil forces and principalities, which we, as in the church um, and through the Bible, call the Satan or devil. Jesus has dealt with that as well. But there's a final one, maybe there's more, but one other thing that is important for the times that we live in, and that it's almost standing out from the scriptures that we revalue for our situation and the challenges that we are facing today. And that is the apocalyptic meaning. Now, apocalypse simply means the, the um, study of the end times. That is something that is almost in the future, that, that is set forth, that will happen. Now, it's 
kind of hard to know what's going to happen um, because we haven't been there. We don't know what the future brings. But there's a certain expectation that we get from the Bible that is very different from the way that the modern man speaks of in the times that we live in. The modern man thinks in a paradigm or a, um, a set of a mindset of cause and effect. Everything that is caused will have a certain effect. We also get to know it as the butterfly effect. It's the choices and the things that we do will have a certain measurable outcome to it. And therefore we can almost um, project the future from the, what we analyze in the way that and the choices that we make. There's almost a certainty to it. So if we as a humankind can get the, our mindset, our collective mindset to be positive and to make uh, good choices, we can almost guarantee a positive outcome, almost an utopia. But if we can't get that to happen and people keep making wrong decisions and bad choices, it can end up in um, a hellish kind of place. Now, there's almost a movement throughout history from there being very positive about 20 years ago to the experience that we are not doing well with this. And uh, the outcome that we foresee looking at uh, environmental issues and looking at the difference between the, the wealth spread through humankind in the world and different other places, we start to realize that we're heading in a negative kind of spiral. Both of them are the same mindset. It's almost an open-ended. It all depends on what we as human beings do. It's in our hands. It's our choices. But there's such a way that the Bible, uh, the writers of the Bible, thought about it. It was not their mindset. Now, Matthew is one of the uh, writers of the Bible that helps us to unlock this mindset and these questions that comes with it. If you think about the future, not as an open end, but with a closed end, there's a certainty and that that closeness is not in the hands of humanity. It's in the hands of the King of Kings. It's in the hands of God himself. And that's what we as the people of God, as believers in Christ and Jesus Christ, need to rediscover and re-appreciate to, to have meaning of that in our lives. Therefore, I'd like to, us to read in Matthew 24, um, from verse 3 to verse 14. Now, Matthew, this periscope is part of a bigger um, sermon that Jesus is giving on a mountain, but not this time not on a mountain, um, in this, as in the beginning, the Sermon on the, on the Mount, but it's another sermon. The first one was about the law. The next, second one is about the prophets. And as you know, that in this Old Testament, it's the law and the prophets. So Matthew is including this idea that Jesus is giving a new law, not a new law, but interpretation of the law and the opening up of the law and, the, and also of the future, of our expectation of what is um, going to happen and that it is in his hands. So let us read Matthew 24 from verse 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, 
and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see it to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now, as I said, I want to come back to the deceive, uh, deceiving force that Jesus um, foretell. And, and maybe that our mindset, our modern mindset, is also a deceiving um, experience. It deceives us not to look at, at what Christ has did in the Bible through the eyes and through the meaning that he intended it to be. To, to have a renewed focus and new glasses in looking towards the end of times, an eschatological expectation, not of humankind, but of God, of Jesus Christ himself. The disciples asked three questions, and Jesus didn't answer the first one. Um, the first question, which is, when will this happen? Um, nobody knows when it will happen. Jesus doesn't want us to know for obvious reasons. The second answer that Jesus gives and what is going to happen, what's the signs of the, um, of the things that will happen at this time, also doesn't um, give us a chronological kind of thing that we can analyze and say, okay, it's growing close to a certain time. It's things that happen throughout. Throughout the history, it happened already. It's times of tribulation and, and challenges. And it's not a beautiful picture that is described for this time um, before then. Um, Matthew describes it with, with hardships, almost in the word of birth pains. Going through that is a creation that is sighing of the struggles. Now, if everything goes good, one tends not to sigh and not to experience the birth pains. It's almost as if you don't have any expectations. You, you're not waiting ex, uh, expectate, with an expectation and with the anxiety for an end time to happen. You're quite content and you just go on with your lives in the way that you and you're positive about it. At the moment when things happen that you experience, but this is, uh, this is troublesome, you renew this vision of the end time. The, the thing that Jesus wants to focus on is that amidst of all this events and troublesome things that we may experience throughout history, there's one theme that he wants us to do, and that is to stand firm. Not to loosen the grip, not to loosen our vision, not to loosen our um, excitement and our expectation uh, as a burning uh, desire in our hearts for it to happen. Because we need that vision and that um, expectation in order to stand firm in our faith and to stand firm in what we do and what we are called to do by Jesus Christ in building his kingdom and taking part of the wonderful works that he is doing. 
Another thing that we realize in this text of scripture is that when Jesus describes the eschaton, the end times, that it's not like John did in Revelation with uh, streets of gold and all that kind of thing, or a garden with a stream. And it's not the setting that he describes, it's more the person that he describes. It's Jesus Christ that he describes. Jesus is the eschaton. He is the end. Um, there's two verses in Ephesians that I would like to share that help us to understand how Jesus himself is our expectation. And that is about his coming and not the new world that is coming. The first is uh, Ephesians 1 verse 10. I'm going to read from verse 9. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. And then, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. The purpose of it all is to bring everybody and everything um, under one head, under Jesus Christ. It's almost it's the sole kingship. Now, we're living in an understanding of the world in a kind of duality way, that there's different kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the earthly kingdom still. But we're looking forward to a kingdom where Jesus Christ will be the Lord of lords and the king of kings and there will be no other no um, kingdom that is challenging that the other text is in ephesians 4 verse 10 he who descended descended jesus is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe so it's not just being and sitting on the throne, but it is also a, a, a time when Jesus will be in everything. He will fill the whole world and will fill everything in him. So that's why Jesus is the Alpha, but also the Omega. He is the end. He is the Amen. When we realize this and when we look through the glasses of Matthew and of the the writers of the Bible, then we have got a different feel to our expectation of the future. An expectation that I think is um, very important in the times that we live in. An expectation that helps us to stand firm, to keep on doing what Jesus has called us to do, and not to get easy about it, not to be um, nonchalant about it, but to be anxious. As um, John in um, Revelation 3 said, that this, the, the metaphor between being cold and being hot for Jesus and for the gospel, and he in that time already experienced that people is going into a place of being lukewarm Christians. And this time we are challenged and re reminded that this God doesn't like lukewarmness. But in order to stay and to keep being warm and to keep being excited about the gospel and to stand firm in Jesus Christ, is to have a firm vision on the end, on the eschaton, on the future. On the eschatology. So I hope that this week of the great week of Lent and what the crucifixion on Friday that we celebrate and eventually the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that through this mirror, through this prism and the meanings of what happens when the light shines through that, that we experience, that the eschatological meaning will have new um, force of enthusiasm and power to stand firm in our faith and to spread that message throughout the world. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for 
this opportunity of the great week of the Lent to have experienced the light of God shining in our lives in these three days in the history that is so phenomenal in meaning. But Lord, I like pray that the, the meaning of the eschatological um, expectation of the end of that you are the eschaton, that you are the amen, you are the alpha and the omega, and we are looking forward to that, that that will help us as the church of Christ, as your people, to stand firm and to remain being warm and hot in our faith for you. And we pray, Lord, that we will um, be positive and excited to spread this gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, of your kingdom, where you will be the sole king and lord of lords and king of kings, and the time where you will include all in Christ, that you will be in everyone and everything on earth. Lord, that is what we are looking forward to, and why we as church and as the world is sighing as we go through the birth pains. I pray this in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.